is going on, White Sox fans? My name is Michael Suero, and welcome to another episode of the Pipeline to 35th, a Sox on 35th show where we keep you up to date on all things going on in the White Sox farm system. Uh, before we get started, just a quick reminder, you can watch all of these episodes on our YouTube channel at Sox on 35th, and you can also listen to them via podcast through Apple, Spotify, or wherever you download and listen to your podcasts. In just a few minutes, James Fox from Future Sox is going to be joining the show, and we're going to break down all the moves that the White Sox made at the trade deadline, uh, along with maybe getting into some draft talk, breaking down a few of the draft picks that the White Sox recently made uh, earlier in July. And overall, just kind of evaluating the state of the White Sox farm system now compared to where it was uh, pre-MLB draft. I think we can all kind of agree all they've done is really add players. So it's not like the farm system's gotten worse or anything, but I do think that it'll be valuable for all of us to kind of talk it through see where they added, and just overall take stock in the farm system as a whole, a farm system that is growing stronger and stronger. Uh, But before we bring him on, let's just do a quick review of the moves that the White Sox made at the deadline. Most notably, in a three-way trade, the White Sox sent out Eric Fetty, Michael Kopech, and Tommy Pham, and received three players from the Dodgers, one being former top prospect Miguel Vargas, along with two lower-level middle infield prospects in Alexander Albertus and Gerald Perez. Along with that, the Sox also shipped out Tanner Banks to the Philadelphia Phillies for a high-A shortstop prospect William Bergola. They also moved Eloy Jimenez to the Baltimore Orioles, plus some cash, for left-handed reliever Trey McGow, and they traded Paul DeYoung to the Kansas City Royals for uh, right-handed relief pitching prospect Gerald Rosado. So most notably, the Eric Fetty trade has come with some differing opinions, I would, <laughs> to put it nicely. Um, I think overall, everyone kind of agrees they probably should have gotten a little more in that trade, and the whole process of getting to that trade brought some questions. But there's differing opinions on the thoughts of just in general the package that the Sox got in return. The headliner was Miguel Vargas. There's, There's no question about that. Miguel Vargas was a top 50 prospect as early as coming into the 2022 season, uh, came up as a third baseman in the Dodgers organization, but they ended up moving him to second base uh, on opening day of that year because of uh, roster needs. And they've also dabbled with him in left field and kind of have moved him around a little bit throughout the baseball field. Uh, It does look like the White Sox are going to primarily play him at third base, which again is his natural position. So we'll see if maybe just giving him a clear defensive home could help him in the long run. It's, you know, he hasn't gotten off to the strongest start in his MLB career, but he's still always been a dominant hitter throughout the minor league levels. He has that offensive upside in him. Maybe giving him a more stable defensive home can help him unlock some of that offensive potential that is yet to be seen, but it does look like that is the way that the White Sox are trending. And along with that, the two uh, middle infield prospects that they received both have plenty of upside. Um, You know, Perez has a little more pop in his bat than uh, Albertus does, but both of them do carry some solid offensive upside. Both of them appear to be, Uh, pretty patient at the plate considering both of them are only 19 years old. They do have some mature approaches at the plate. So that is something that is needed in this organization. And I do think will be an asset. We won't know if these guys really have MLB futures for another year or two, at least. However, these are both very promising prospects that the White Sox received. 
And it was also reported that there could be another player to be named later in this trade package. So if and when that's announced, we will make sure to break it down for you all. Uh, But I do not want to get too far into the weeds of all these moves because we are going to break down all of it with James Fox. Uh, So with that being said, let's bring him on the show now so we can start breaking down all of these trade deadline moves. Joining us now... Uh, on the pipeline to 35th uh, from Future Sox. Uh, he is widely regarded as the go-to source for all things related to White Sox minor league baseball, uh, James Fox. James, thanks for joining the show, man. Hey, man, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, so the White Sox made some moves uh, over this last week, and I, I think they, they – uh, Everyone agreed that those were all pretty good moves. I don't think anyone had an issue with any of them or anything like well, the that. First, the first one, right? Like, I feel like a lot of people are mad about the Fetty one. And even, like, I was kind of surprised, like, the industry, like, like just talking about it being a disaster, right? That was a little surprising to me. We talked about that on our show, but we can, you know, get into that here if you want. Yeah, I mean, it, it was surprising. I thought the same thing. Like, I don't know. I think we both kind of agreed that was the, the return a little light? Sure, but for the most part, like it, especially considering all the other moves for starting pitching, I think it seemed fairly reasonable for what they uh, for what they ended up trading. But um, let let's start there. So I want to I want to hear from you your thoughts. What did you think about the trade as a whole, and what do you think about the individual players that we brought back in that trade that sent out Fetty, Kopech, and Fam in that three way trade? So that was the thing for me, right? Like, I, I kind of like the players, but it, but I just felt like the return was at least one player short. I don't really care about the Cardinals end of it. Like, a lot of people were kind of like, oh, the Cardinals didn't give up enough. Like, it's not really how three-way trades work. Like, I, but I do think, like, I don't understand the Michael Kopech part. Like, if you traded Eric Fetty, you know, and Edmund went to the Dodgers, and you ended up with Vargas um, and Perez you know, and the, you know, and Albertus, like for just Fetty and even like fam, like as a throw in, like, I think that's fine. I just think it's a player short because of the Kopech part. I think a lot of people have not necessarily underrated Vargas, but like they've undervalued that asset, right? Like a lot of people talked about, there was no top 100 prospects traded at the deadline, according to baseball America. Well, Vargas was a top 45 prospect in baseball a year ago. And now he's not right. And the White Sox for, and you can like debate this. They're looking for position players, right? Because they've kind of backed themselves into a corner. They want to trade for position players and not pitching. Well, if that's the case, the only way to get impact position players in trades right now is to get these post-hype prospects and be right about them or get teenagers. And they did both. So I, I don't know. I kind of feel like if there's one other piece in that trade, it, it's fine. Keith Law was the only one who kind of liked the return for the White Sox. Everybody else said it was a disaster. I'm not going to go that far. They clearly like um, Vargas. They think he could be a middle of the order bat. He's always sported 400 on base percentages in the minors. Like, like I, I could argue that Vargas was the best player that a seller acquired at the deadline. I don't know that I would, but I could if I wanted to. You know, like that. He he's not a prospect anymore technically, but it's like the type of impact you want in a headliner. And I think Perez is the second piece is pretty good too. Yeah. I mean, I think you nailed it on the head. Like if Vargas was still technically a prospect, I think people would be looking at it a bit differently because like you said, this guy was a top 45, top 50 prospect not too long ago. And he's absolutely destroyed triple a pitching over the last couple of years. I mean, I, the hype around him has died down a little bit. I get it, but He's a perfectly fine headliner, in my opinion. And I also agree, Perez, with he's got some pop in that bat. I There's a little more strikeouts in that bat, but I, I'm i intrigued by him as well. And then Alberta says the third piece. Overall, the players, I agree, were solid. Would I have liked to see a fourth piece? Yes, completely agree with you on that as well. We'll see there is supposedly, potentially, a player to be named later. We'll see if that turns into anything or if it just ends up being cash considerations again, which I'm not going to get my hopes up too much, but we'll see when that comes out. Um, But that's not the only move that the Sox made. They also made three other moves, trading trading Tanner Banks, trading Eloy Jimenez, surprisingly, 
and Paul DeYoung, all for uh, each getting one prospect back individually. So in terms of those three trades, I know Banks got a bit more of a more highly regarded prospect than the other two. I think the other two prospects are just flyers at this point. But overall, what did you think about those moves that the Sox made? Yeah, see, I think those three were all fine. They're they're all like appropriate returns. I mean, look, if they weren't going to trade Garrett Crochet and Luis Robert, like you weren't going to remake your farm system at the trade deadline. I think the Paul D. Young move is fine. You got a young guy that you think projects in your bullpen um, for a really cheap, like right-handed bat, like right-handed bats just, you know, you, you don't get that much for these guys at the deadline. Um, the Tanner Banks one was pretty good. Um, William Bergala doesn't have like a ton of, I get, I think upside is the wrong word, right? But he's not going to hit for power, but he controls the strike zone. He plays defense. He runs. So he's like a definite top 30 guy, like right in the middle of their system. He was a $2 million signing out of Venezuela, I believe two years ago. So he was like one of the, the big Philly signings, getting a guy like that for Tanner Banks. It's pretty good. Tanner Banks is solid, but he's 32, but he still had control, but he's no use for this White Sox team or the 2025 White Sox. So that trade um, made a lot of sense. And then the Aloy Jimenez one was surprising. Like I'm like, they're going to save a little bit of money. I think there's mixed reports out there on how much the White Sox sent. Um, it seems like the White Sox definitely have to pay one and a half million of the $3 million buyout next year. And then the Orioles have picked up a chunk of like his remaining, but look, I mean, you were clearly going to have to buy out Aloy Jimenez for three million dollars. They're going to if they save half of that, and they get a twenty-six-year-old lefty reliever that might help you at some point. I, you know, whatever. I, I think that's good. I was stunned that anybody took Aloy Jimenez. Like that, that part of the deadline was a bit surprising to me. No, I was I was shocked when that one came out as well. And at first, I just figured when they announced the trade, it was just going to be a salary dump. But mm-hmm. to actually get something of value i mean it was a 26 year old relief pitcher like it's nothing special but just to get money off the books and bring in someone that was a halfway decent reliever in the minors like i'll take that as a win honestly um and then i was uh, surprised i was surprised by the baltimore end of it just because like they have a bunch of high-end prospects that they won't trade for anything but they're gonna like find time for aloy jimenez to play like it just doesn't really make much sense to me yeah, all they're willing to move right now is Connor Norby at the at the high end of their trade. So I, I've I've had issues with what the Orioles have been doing for the last couple of years. They weren't willing to move right. anything for Cease. They clearly weren't willing to offer what it would take to get a high end pitcher this time around. It seems like they're just always going with the second or third options, just always going like bargain hunting. Everywhere. Well, and that's like and that's a debate that I've had with people about this deadline that we're mad, right? And it's kind of like like you have to put Miguel Vargas in focus, right? He's not on prospect lists, but like, I mean, if, if the White Sox traded Fetty for Connor Norby and Josh Stowers, like I, I would not have been happy about that, yeah. you know? Like, so I, I thought he had a little more value just because I was saying that like, I thought they'd get a top 100 prospect and then another org top 10. I guess Vargas is similar to a top 100 prospect and Perez would be top 10. Like, in some systems, right? He wasn't mm-hmm. in the Dodger system. He's like in the early teens in the White Sox system. So maybe I was right. About, but I mean, like, that's like not a good return. The Astros trade, and I know we're going off topic a little bit here. Like everybody like was talking about how well the Jays did and they might have like Kikuchi was a rental, but I mean, like, I just think you have to have some idea of like how bad these systems are. Like Houston's the 29th or 30th ranked system. So yeah, they had to trade their like two of their top guys, but two of their top guys don't equal two of another people's top guys, you know? So it's just, there, there wasn't a ton of value dealt at this trade deadline, which doesn't necessarily bode that well for the White Sox going forward. I think like, you know, you want to cash in crochet and Robert this off season, you won't do it unless you get premium returns. And I think premium players will still bring back premium returns, but man, like teams are not trading high end prospects anymore. No, I mean, it's, I, I think we saw a little more in terms of value coming back for maybe high leverage relievers, but for the most part, the returns were underwhelming to say the least. And I I go back to the argument too, like did the return for Fetty seem like yes, but again, look at all these other returns. I agree with you. Like I wouldn't necessarily preferred that Orioles package 
because Connor Norby, I just don't think is that much more valuable than Vargas and Stowers. I mean, sure, there's power in Stowers' bat, but he's also striking out like 36% yeah. of the time. Like, And he's 26 years old. Yeah, exactly. Like, at least with what we got in return, we got the MLB ready guy in Vargas, and then you've got two guys that, yeah, they're a little farther off, but they also bring back a lot of upside at least. And there's that's something that the Sox really lack right now is – is hitting prospects in their lower levels that actually might have an MLB future. Aside from Wolko, they really don't have much of that in the system. So building up that depth, I I don't know. I personally don't have a problem with it. Yeah. And I don't know how much they'll like in a Robert or crochet trade. I don't know how much they'll focus on 19 year olds. Right. I think they'd probably like something a little bit closer. Um, you know, but we have like the whole off season to kind of discuss like some of those packages and what teams might be interested after they, miss out in the playoffs and don't win a world series and that sort of thing. Yep. I, I agree with you. And in general, those are the higher ticket trade pieces anyway. So you can be a little more demanding in those trade talks as well. Um, so I, though that was going to be my next question, but I take it you're okay with the decision to not move Robert or crochet now. I mean, instead of in just wait until the off season, see, uh, what kind of returns you could potentially get then. Yeah, I think so. I just like don't think it's maximum value for either guy right now. Like, could they have gotten like a lot for crochet? Pro- probably. I don't know what the offers were, but I mean, if you're dealing with three teams, like I'd much rather deal with 10 or 15 teams in the off season, because I think for crochet, especially it brings small market clubs into the mix. Like mm. small market contenders should be an option for crochet this off season with two years of control, a couple other things that it does. You're allowed to trade for guys that were just drafted in 2024. So those guys could be part of trade talks in theory. Um, it also opens up the possibility that you could trade for um, competitive balance picks, like in the 2025 draft, once those are awarded, which I think is going to be super important to acquire at least another one, you know, just kind of do what the nationals did this year. The nationals were victims of, of the same rule this year that the White Sox will be next year. Like the White Sox are going to be the worst team maybe ever. They're picking 10th next year. Um, They still pick first in every other round. Um, So the bonus pool will be okay. But I mean, if you can get like a comp balance, a pick, you can almost make up the difference between 10 and what you would have had like in the top four somewhere. Um, And then you could maybe push a guy down. You could get an extra player. The nationals, you know, the nationals just did the same thing. So the White Sox should definitely be trying to acquire more draft picks Um, you know, and like they scouted the 2024 draft heavily. So if you want players from that draft in return for crochet and Robert and kind of line things up a little bit, that wouldn't surprise me at all either. No, I think those are both excellent points to think about. And something that I don't think a lot of people are talking about enough that the one, the amount of teams that are going to be in on crochet is going to grow in the off season. But like you said, there's just going to be more options of pieces you can get in return with all of these recent draft picks, potentially getting in competitive balance picks. I mean, even the White Sox, they just did that last offseason in the Gregory Santos trade. And, you know, it's, right. I think it's definitely mm-hmm. something that maybe they're not for sure going to you know, demand a, a, compel, a competitive balance pick, but it's at least at their disposal and they can really get creative with the returns that they're asking for these guys in the off season. Um, so. Well, it's definitely, it's, yeah, sorry. It's definitely an option. Like if you, like there were rumors about the pirates being interested in Luis Robert. Right. And you, yeah. you take a look at their system and it's just like, like they couldn't get it done to the point where like the white Sox would actually pull the trigger. Right. Well, if the pirates want two years or three years, actually, excuse me, of Luis Robert in December, and now maybe pretend who knows if this is true. Right. But like maybe Connor Griffin's on the board, maybe like their competitive balance pick. Right. So maybe there were two prospects that you liked in a Robert deal that now you could add Connor Griffin and the, whatever the 37th pick in the draft to, and now you have a Luis Robert deal. You know what I mean? And that's the type of guy who like the pirates could pay for three years and you have a superstar, you know, that adds, adds to your young team. So stuff like that, I think makes sense. Yeah. And uh, personally, Connor Griffin was the guy that I was eyeing in the draft. Um, So that type of return, I would not be upset with at all. But I mean, yeah, I just think in general, if a team like the Pirates is interested in Robert, 
that's a more enticing trade package than they could put together now. And then even with Crochet, like I just don't really know what the value ever was going to be with him. Even before his agent leaked all that stuff, like you just don't really know how his arm's going to hold up the rest of the year. So that's something that could have played against Getz in trade talks. And I just think in general, you're going to maximize his value more easily in this off season than you would have at the deadline. They probably would have gotten a good return in general, but I think waiting it out is where you're really going to maximize his value. Yeah. And you get more, you just get more teams in the mix. I mean, and I'm sure it'll be the same teams. It'll be Dodgers. It'll be Padres. The Yankees will be back involved. You know, you just, you just, you'd rather have more teams after the guy. I am pretty convinced though, that, that they'll trade him just like I was with Cease. I just, I just don't think it makes that much sense for Garrett Crochet to be the opening day starter for the White Sox in 25 unless he's staying long term, right? Now, if you were going to tell me you're signing him to like a six year deal and, you know, anchoring your team around him, like that also makes sense. But what doesn't make sense is like letting him pitch for you in the first half and like trying to trade him at next year's deadline. Just do it this winter, they'll get enough. No, I completely agree with you. And waiting any longer than after the season, which I'm sure they're probably going to limit his innings anyways, but waiting any longer than that, you're just risking injury at this point, and it's not going to be worth it to wait until next year's deadline. I just – they'll get enough interest this off season, and I'm with you. I think a trade's going to happen. Pers- personally, I think it also makes sense to extend him. I mean, you just don't find aces like him you know, growing off trees, so why they – haven't pushed harder to extend him is beyond me personally, but in general, a, a trade is going to revamp this farm system, which I do think they still need to do as well. Reg- well, it's just because they don't pay, they just don't pay pitching, you know, like it's just not something that they do unless it's like a big time bargain. And honestly, like that's where it, like the extension thing kind of threw me off guard for Garrett Crochet because like, I really don't think anybody was going to pick him up and like run him into the ground. No. with two more years of control. That doesn't make any sense. Like I totally understand him not wanting to pitch in the bullpen. Doesn't make sense, but like could he go every 5 or 6 days for two innings and pitch in the playoffs? I kind of thought yes. Mm-hmm. Um I don't think anybody was going to you know, like treat him that way like after acquiring him. It doesn't really make much sense to me. And if I were him, like I wouldn't want an extension with anybody. No. He's he's two off seasons away from 200 million dollars. Like, and I know that's easy for me to say, right, with the injury history and that sort of thing. But I mean, he's got a brand new arm, basically. Like, so for me, I'd be go, I'd be dead set on going to free agency and having ten bidders, you know, and because he'll get he'll get paid a ton. Oh, for sure. And just in general, it was odd to me how he just or has his agency kind of tanked his or tried to tank his trade value. I mean, why are they? Why are they do? Do they really want him to stick around with the White Sox? Yeah, I don't know. I thought the whole thing was was kind of weird, and like the way that yeah. it was out there, and like uh, I don't know. And I know a lot of people take issue with like Chris Getz like being so publicly upset about it, but like I, I mean, yeah, it was the whole thing was was strange. It, it really was. I don't. I don't really get the rhyme or reason around it. Like, yeah, you're trying to preserve your client's arm. I get that to a degree, but just the way it went was just weird. I don't know, like just again, I just can't get over the fact that he was almost purposely making sure he stayed with the potentially the worst team in MLB history. So it's it was it was odd to say the least, Um, but we could get on we can get on this topic for I don't know. We could talk about this for hours. So um, just kind of moving on a little bit here, we already kind of touched on it a little bit. But I wanted to get your thoughts on what the White Sox did a few weeks ago in the draft. I mean, pick five came up, and I think, you know, they they did what we all thought they were going to do and pick the left-handed reliever over all of the hitters that were available, like everyone thought they were going to. Um, But uh, just in general, what did you think about how the White Sox attacked the top of the draft? So, like, I was totally fine with them taking Higginsmith, but I was thrown off just because... Like, I really believed that they were going to take a hitter and they really wanted to take a hitter and they were telling everybody that. And I did a bunch of radio spots and interviews and podcasts like this one. And I said, like, I just didn't talk about Hagen Smith that much because I just, I just like didn't think they were going to do it. I thought they were going to take a bat. Now, in hindsight, you know, like they were involved up at the top of the draft. Like, apparently the White Sox offered 
Charlie Condon nine and a half million dollars if he could get to five. Wow. Yeah, yeah, like they were gonna go way over to get Charlie Condon. Um, obviously didn't work. Colorado took him, paid him, which is fine. Yep. Had Travis Bazana not gone one, he would have fallen to five. Now, would the White Sox have taken Bazana over Smith? I don't, I don't know. I don't have that answer. But I mean, you know, I also had heard that the the White Sox had kind of um, they had medically red flagged. JJ Weatherholt, who is the player that I might have taken at five. Like if I was dead set on taking a bat, like I might have just taken Weatherholt because I think he's going to be pretty good and he's also mm-hmm. safe, right? So then the, your other options, like Jack Caglione, who a lot of people I think wanted or thought were, I just, after the draft, like some things kind of leaked out that Chris Getz wanted an up the middle player or a pitcher. Um, I just, I didn't really see. Chris Getz and look, it's Mike Shirley, right? But like, it's Chris Getz's first draft as GM. I just like didn't see him using that pick on a first baseman. I just didn't. And people might disagree with that. And people think Kags is awesome, but there's a decade long history of first baseman taken in the first and second round. It's just not good. So, you know, like I'm okay there. And then Connor Griffin is the player that I wanted too, because I thought it would come at a significant discount, but Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, he took forever to sign with Pittsburgh. I think they were at, I think there was a price probably where the White Sox would have done that. And I think the video, I don't know if you've seen, you probably have, there's a video of Chris Getz talking to Mike Shirley, like right around the, the time that the pick was made and Getz makes a comment, something along the lines of like, we want him, like, this is what we're doing. We're taking him like about Hagen Smith. And to me, it just seems like Shirley had other options, right? Like, hey, we can take the position player, save money, do this. And then it's Chris Getz, like, no, if you think Hagen Smith's the best guy, like, we're doing it and paying him. And now we know, like, they paid him $8 million, which is an overslot bonus, right, at five. Kansas City was after him. St. Louis was after him. So for whatever reason, they paid him $8 million. Um, he can be really good, top of the rotation, front end lefty. Um, and, and the one thing that's good about it, I think, is just like while you don't have the position player talent or depth in your system, I'm the most confident of all these guys that Hagen Smith will be really good with the White Sox because they've developed guys like this before. Like Hagen Smith will be awesome here, you know? Like I could totally see J.J. Weatherholt coming here, being hurt a lot, Connor Griffin not fixing the swing, Cags being first base only and chasing a ton and being okay but not great, right? With Hagen Smith, like I think he's going to be a top of the rotation stud with the White Sox because that's what they do with lefties like this. Yeah, and you just nailed it on the head. The White Sox have the track record of developing this exact type of pitcher. So in that sense, it does make sense, and we probably should have been eyeing that possibility a bit more. I was with you. I think I wrote a I wrote an article, and I think I just briefly mentioned. Uh, Chase Burns and Hagen Smith in your article just to talk about them because they were probably or at least one of them was going to be available but I really didn't think that they were going to go with a pitcher at five because all the smoke was around hitters I thought when Cags was there that that was going to be the pick I wouldn't have loved it I don't love taking first baseman that high I mean we've already got a first and second round first baseman on the roster right now that are both just whatever they're okay but they're not they're just kind of taking up roster spots at this point and Andrew Vaughn and Gavin Sheets. So I wouldn't have loved going back there anyways. And it really didn't fit Getz's MO early on in terms of roster building. Like he values defense. He values people that can, you know, help out help out his pitching uh from behind him. And it Cags just really didn't fit that mold. Um again, I would have taken Connor Griffin, because like you said. He would have saved them a little bit in terms of their uh, bonus pool. And he came with probably the loudest tools in the entire draft. Do I trust that they would have developed him properly? That's another question, (laughs) but that's the pick I would have made. But I'm with you. Hagen Smith, I think, is a stud. Um, I know a lot of people were kind of upset about it because they didn't go with a bat, but I'm fully with you. I fully expect him to develop into at least – above average pitcher in this system because that's just what the Sox do with guys like Sale and mm-hmm. Crochet, Schultz, and now uh, Hagen Smith as that kind of same profile pitcher. Um, but it's not the only pick that the Sox made. They made some other ones too. They drafted a couple prep guys to end day one, and then they pretty much focus on the college ranks uh, for the rest of the draft after that. 
Um, I know that the two prep guys that they drafted on day one, they're probably not going to make their debut until next year. But we are going to also see some guys make their debuts in either low A Canapolis, maybe even uh, high A Winston-Salem. So in general, what are you looking uh, looking forward to seeing from the rest of this draft class? Yeah, so I think like Bonimer is a really important pick for them. But like you said, we're not going to see him. Like he's just going to play, play these like bridge games in Arizona, mm-hmm. you know, where like, look, we might get some video from somebody, one of the photographers out there. I'm sure he'll be a big focus of their instructional league team. But I mean, look, he's going to play in the ACL or in the ACL probably next year. But I mean, that's a, you know, a high, highly regarded prep hitter. And they paid him like the number 29 overall pick, um, 3 million bucks. Blake Larson's a guy they knew very well. I'm totally fine with like the rest of their day one approach. Um, They wanted to add hitters. They did so on day two. I just, I just didn't know much about these guys, right? But the White Sox love them. They think they're right. They think these were like a big, bo- big focal point, like of their class. Um, I always like to restack the class by how much they pay guys. So Casey Saki was their fourth rounder, okay? But they, you know, they they paid him um, like pretty handsomely, like a third rounder, right? It was like. I don't even remember like what the what the bonus was at this point for Casey Saki, but um, you know they they definitely paid him quite a bit. I think it was like eight hundred and fifty k, which is more than they paid McLean. So they cut a deal with McLean in round three because they thought somebody else was going to take him, and then they took Saki. And then the Sam Antonacci kid is um, from Coastal Carolina. He was the best player in JUCO the year before that with crazy numbers. So. Kind of like what you alluded to, um, these guys are going out to affiliates. Um, our Elijah Evans like broke the other day just that Saki, it sounds like, is going to go straight to Winston, which is a little bit of a surprise, but this is something we've been talking about at Future Sox. Like, th- there's just – not that like the Sox are teaming with, with prospects, right? But there's not like a ton of spots for all these guys – to play because the issue is like a lot of the players at Winston aren't ready to go to Birmingham. You have George Wolko in canny. You have multiple like young Dominican or international prospects that have been solid there that mm-hmm. can't really move. So Saki going to go to Winston Salem. McLean is not ready. He needed like an extra ramp up because he just like hasn't played in a while. So he's in Arizona like hitting still. So he's not reporting, but it sounds like the other college bats are um, probably this week for Tuesday. So Antonacci, Jordan Appel's the catcher um, from Texas A&M. And then most of those day three guys, Lyle Miller Green and McCants and Archer. It sounds like these guys are all going to be in Kannapolis next week. Um, And then the pitchers, it seems like are a little bit further away from that. They're pitching bullpens. They'll probably be in games like by mid August, I would imagine. And then we'll see them and then they'll all be in instructs after that. But, you know, make no mistake. Like the, the White Sox think, that McLean and Antonacci and uh, Saki are like big parts of this draft class that are like potentially quick moving like college hitters. And now we'll just have to like, see if they're right. Basically. Nope. That makes sense. And uh, I, I looked it up while you were uh, talking. Yeah. Uh, Saki got eight, eight fifty, and yeah. McLean got 800. So yeah. Yeah. So there's something, there's something weird with the draft where like you can, it's like there's an extra two and a half um, that you can pay. I think mm-hmm. it's like, yeah, it's like 2.5 K. Yeah. But that doesn't count. So that gets you to the 850, right? So yeah. I, I don't know. It's very strange. But um, a lot of weird rules with the yeah. draft. Yeah. And, 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 and we, all- had, we had kind of talked about this on our show where like they didn't add a ton of starting pitchers because there's no spots to pitch, but they really did. It seems they like targeted bullpen arm, potential bullpen arms with weird slots. And this is like a mm-hmm. Brian Bannister thing where like all these guys are different. Like Phil Fox has the flattest fastball in the draft. And there's like the, the Aaron Combs guy has started and pitched in relief. They really liked him. And then the two flamethrowers on day three were just basically like these guys that have premium stuff in college that can't throw strikes and their coaches like didn't trust them to pitch, which sounds like, okay, why would you take these guys? Right. But it's because they have premium stuff and in the minor leagues, you can just like throw a guy out there every day. Cause it doesn't matter. Like if you're the coach at the university of San Francisco or the university of Alabama, you just, you can't throw a guy that's like going to lose you games and not, and not throw. So those guys are pretty interesting. Um, 
it's uh, you know the the pick in the eleventh round, and then Pierce George in round thirteen. Um, both of those guys are premium reliever profiles, so that was like an interesting part of the draft too. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, that was uh, Blake Shepardson and Pierce George, and uh, Pierce George even got slightly over slot too, which was a bit surprising. But I mean, yeah, like you said, the the Sox really seem to like some of these guys. I like Saki a lot too. I think that there is potential in that bat. Um, yeah, those three through five picks all are hit, have a little bit of they have some intriguing tools in those bats. Um, Antonasi is much more hit over power, but. Um, you got some. You got a little more pop with Saki, and just in general, I'm curious to see how these guys uh, develop. I am surprised. I did see Elijah's tweet about Saki going straight to high eight. That one really did surprise me. But if the Sox are confident in him, and kind of like you said, like there's just not a ton of players that are ready to move up uh, at those lower levels. So that one's intriguing, but I'm I'm going to be following him. I'm really curious to see how he uh, how he starts his minor league career. Um, yeah, so I mean, going right to Winston, uh, it's interesting, right? You just like kind of have to be right about it because you don't want to mm-hmm. go there and then have him like struggle right away. You know, one thing I'll put out there that that I found interesting, and I know that we're not allowed to say anything nice about the general manager of the White Sox right now because he's you know terrible and in over his head, and every move he makes is incorrect, but. I do like some of the offensive profiles that have been targeted. So Bonhammer's not a, you know, this like huge walk plate patience guy. He's more of like a power hitting prep guy, but he's a prep guy. Right. But there are other moves. They all had really good walk rates. Um, they all control the strike zone, McLean, Saki and Antonacci. So it's just like a different thing. Like you're, you're not selling out for power. It's guys that have a pretty good idea of like what they're doing in the box. The walk rates are high they did the same thing at the deadline yep. with Albertus, um, with Bergola, um, and with Perez, like all those guys are similar, which is why, like, I think it's fair to say that Chris Getz might have like a little bit of a type. I mean, even like Samuel Zavala, who I think has struggled a little bit, like with the batting average, like he walks a ton. So mm-hmm. I do think this is like a thing, like it hasn't been in my time covering the White Sox or covering prospects, like, guys with 10% plus walk rates, like, but it seems like that that's something that they're targeting. And that's actually a good thing. Yeah. I mean, that's something that Rick Hahn really never focused on was guys that can get on base aside from bringing in uh, our own uh, Jordan Lazowski's favorite player of all time. Yes. Bonnie Grandal. Um, other than that, like, yeah, he didn't really focus on on base percentage and that really seems to be, big thing that Getz has been focusing on almost like overcorrecting because there was just such a lack of plate discipline in this organization. So I really think that I agree with you. He's really focusing on bringing in those types of guys that can work pitch counts, get on base uh, with in more ways than one and just kind of, you know, build up the, build up the hitting uh, pipeline that way. It's not a bad approach, in my opinion. It's different than what we're used to seeing as Sox fans, as you alluded to. But, I mean, we'll see how it pays off. But we already have guys like Kiro and Colson Montgomery who are walk machines. So adding even more guys like that, I don't see a problem with it personally. Um, we'll see. You know, I, They still have to hit the ball, and we'll see how they develop as they go through the system. But just at least getting guys that, even when they're not hitting, can still impact the game in some way like that. I don't think that's a bad approach at all. Yeah, no, I thought I thought it made a lot of sense, just like with some mm-hmm. of those returns, and we'll see if like that's a focus going forward. Obviously, like this team needs power, but they just need bats. I I think like to me, I think you you buy power at the end if you need to, right? But I think you need like an organizational hitting philosophy before that. They don't really have one. It's one of the things for this off season. Like I would love them to find the Brian Bannister like equivalent on offense, that would be great. Um, that, and you didn't have this on the rundown, but and international scouting as well. Like those are just the two areas where I think if Getz does that, I'm going to feel a lot better just about the operation going forward. Yeah. I, you brought, you brought it up with the international scouting, man. Like just, just what this last week or two, they cut a bunch of some of their more highly regarded international prospects, guys like Eric Hernandez and, these guys who they're 
even the guys that they are throwing money at, mm -hmm. they just aren't panning out. And even Eduardo Herrera, their top international prospect from this past year, he's off to a slow start in the Dominican League. I think his OPS is under 700 at yeah, least. Yeah, it's not, it's not good. And they did, you know, like Yoiker Fallardo is a pitcher um, yeah. from Venezuela. He's got like 57 Ks, the seven walks and 10 starts, 40 innings. So that's good. Like he might be yeah. a dude, right? But – they just it, they just don't have enough, and their strategy doesn't make any sense. I mean, they've signed these older Cubans for years that haven't panned out, and you know when you're going to throw two million at a guy, like it just it has to work because you could assign ten Dominican teenagers instead, and they're not for whatever reason. And I don't know if it's a Reinsdorf problem or a Marco Patti problem, but I do definitely think that you need like a revamp of like your entire infrastructure. Um, and, and I think it's a job for a younger man than Marco Patti. Like at this point, I, I am optimistic that Chris Getz told some writers like Eric Loggenhagen of Fangraphs, you know, this past off season, like, Hey, like we know we need like changes there. We have to approach things differently, which I think is a positive. Now he has to do it. Now the issue is guys for like 25, 26 and 27 are basically committed already. So you're, you're so far behind the eight ball, even if you were to hire someone, um, their top signing for next year is a 17 year old Cuban for $2 million, but at least he's 17 and not 20 or 21. Right. So that's, yeah. I guess, promising. Yeah. I mean, at the very least they have started to shift in that direction instead of paying 22 to 24 year olds, they are starting to put some more money towards these younger 16, 17 year old prospects that have more upside. And I mean, that's a big part of developing a farm system is giving some of these, up these higher upside prospects, you know, yeah. get them through the Dominican league and then bring them up your system and develop them. So at the very least they have attacked that a bit more. It just, they haven't been successful yet doing that. Like I said, well, Eric and, is on the system and when their scouts in their most recent trades, like added the guys we just talked about, right? Samuel yep. Zavala, William Bergola, Alexander Albertus and Jerome Perez. Like those are all other teams, international signings from recent years. Like maybe Marco Patti should sign those guys like as international free agents, like sign guys similar to that. And then you won't have to trade for them when they're 19 playing in low A. What a philosophy right there, huh? Just sign, just sign the guys that you're trading for instead. <laughs> but yeah, man, it's, it's frustrating, but we'll see what we'll see if they do revamp the front office. I agree with you. I'd love to see them bring in some more of these uh Brian Bannister types that can actually help identify and develop right. more profiles. Oh, yeah. Right. Well, I think guys like us, right? I think you just you need to get through this like godforsaken season because then I think like the off season at least like you know, like I still wear White Sox stuff like I have a hat on right now. Like I'll I'll, I'll wear it around the neighborhood like whatever people are like, "Oh, I can't." Like I don't really care what their big league record is. I know it's a story. I know it's important. Like if they have the worst record ever, but I mean, like to me, like if you win 60 games and you're the worst team in baseball or you win 44 games and you're the worst team in baseball, like you're still the worst team in baseball. Yeah. Like it's just, it is what it is. The rules are what they are. You're picking 10th. So there, there's no help there. Right. I think you're going to have a new manager. I think you're going to have more front office changes. And I think you're going to be, you know, the talk of the winner with, two premium trade assets and hopefully, you know, they, they, they do well on those. And, you know, you, you have at least something to look forward to going into 2025, even though you're probably going to lose 95 plus again. Yep. Uh, honestly, I don't, I don't know how to say it any better than that, but it just kind of is what it is. Like the socks are just not in a good place right now. And all we can do is, I mean, we can be upset about it or we can just hope that they can get this rebuild right versus how the last rebuild ended up. But, you know, for the sake of time, I think uh, I think that just about wraps it up here. Um, but before, James, before I let you go, I want to make sure that I give you an opportunity to plug yourself, let our listeners know where they can find you and your content. Yes, I'm at James Fox 917 on Twitter. Um, Future Socks is just at Future Socks. Um, all of our content is there. You can get there at futuresocks.net or .com. It'll take you there. Um, my podcast partner, Ian Eskridge, does a fantastic job sharing all the video um, that we have, and he's been making these pitcher videos. So that's cool. We have uh, multiple podcasts on the station just with Elijah and Jeff Cohen, and then Nick Murawski and Danny Miller do a big league centered show that I'm glad I don't have to do. Um, 
And then me and Ian are live usually Sunday nights. There's going to be some changes to that just because I coach high school football and we're going to meet on Sunday nights. So we'll either be live Sunday night or Monday night going forward. But three podcasts a week, um, content up at the site. Within the next 10 days or so, I'm hoping to have the top 30 list done. It's really tricky because we wait until after the deadline and uh, and the draft to like get these guys on the list. So it's hard to get that written up. But, you know, the mid-season list now is like comes out in mid-August, which is a little bit crazy. Yeah, no, trust me. I'm struggling with mine as well, too, trying to fit all these new acquisitions uh, onto our top 30. But uh, James, thank you again for joining the show. It's been an absolute blast. And I can attest like all the all the guys over at Future Sox are absolutely killing it this year, especially because there's nothing really good to talk about with the White Sox aside from the farm system. But you guys have been doing a great job. And to all of our listeners, I highly recommend checking them out. But once again, James, thank you so much for joining the show. All right, Michael, thanks for having me, man. Thank you again to James Fox for joining us on the show. Got a lot of great insight from him. Um, and we probably could have gone on and ran for another hour or so talking about some of some of the stuff that we hit on uh, in that interview. Uh, but, yep, yeah, that just about wraps up this episode of the Pipeline to 35th. Um, but before I let you go, uh, just a heads up that – James alluded to it that they're working on their midseason top 30 over at Future Sox over on Sox on 35th and Pipeline to 35th. We are also working on our midseason top 30. Uh, expect that to be released uh, later this month. And then we will figure out some kind of special episode uh, revolving around the release of our midseason top 30. Got a couple more things to hammer out for that but it will be released later this month. So just keep an eye on that. And with that being said, thank you all for joining us for another episode of the pipeline to 35th. So again, my name is Michael Suero. It's been a pleasure talking uh, white Sox prospects with you because let's face it. None of us want to actually talk about the real Chicago white Sox nowadays. Um, but unfortunately I do have to sign this off by saying go Sox. 